service the first Sunday after Pentecost is also Trinity Sunday. So our service today will focus on the triune nature of our God. Uh, there's also a bit of a contemporary service this morning. The music will all be played on the piano and other instruments. But we're privileged, privileged to have with us uh, our, our choir for their last uh, song for this uh, choir season. We'll begin our service with the ring of the bells and then join to sing in the opening hymn, hymn number 195.
was victorious. Our condemnation you did commute. As there can be no forgiveness without a price being paid, God himself paid for our sins by sending his own son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And trusting in God's promise that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. It is my duty and delight as a called servant of Christ to announce to you that your sins have indeed been taken away from you. And that you have peace with God through Jesus Christ, your Lord and your Savior. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal spirit, and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. In mercy cleanse our hearts and lips, that free from doubt and fear we may ever worship you, one true immortal God, with your Son and the Holy Spirit living and reigning, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Testament lesson this morning is taken from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. With two they flew. One called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of armies. The whole earth is full of his glory. The foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of the one who called, and the temple was filled with smoke. Then I said, I am doomed, I am ruined, because I am a man with unclean lips, and I dwell among a people with unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, carrying a glowing coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with the coal and said, Look, this has touched your lips, so your guilt is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. This ends our Old Testament lesson. Our psalm this morning is Psalm number 150. This morning the psalm, psalm will be sung by the choir, uh, and a slightly different version than is printed in our worship folder. The choir alone will sing the psalm.
this lesson is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8. Indeed, those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery, so that you are afraid again. But you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we call out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself joins our spirit in testifying that we are God's children. Now if we are children, we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, since we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. This ends our epistle lesson. The anthem will now be sung by the choir.
Holy Gospel is taken from St. John in chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these miraculous signs you are doing unless God is with him. Jesus replied, Amen, amen, I tell you. Unless someone is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I tell you. Unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. Whatever is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be surprised when I tell you that you must be born from above. The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. How can these things be? asked Nicodemus. You are the teacher of Israel, Jesus answered, and you do not know these things? Amen, amen, I tell you. We speak what we know, and we testify about what we have seen. But you people do not accept our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, who is in heaven. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This ends our Gospel lesson. The congregation may be seated. We confess our faith in the triune God with the words of the Athanasian Creed. I will begin the Creed. The congregation is invited to join in in the indented lines of the Athanasian Creed. Whoever wishes to be saved must, above all else, hold to the true Christian faith. Whoever does not keep this faith pure in all points will certainly perish forever. Now this is the true Christian faith. We worship one God in three persons, and three persons in one God, without mixing the persons or dividing the divine being. For each person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is distinct. But the deity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, equal in glory and co-eternal in majesty. What the Father is, so is the Son, and so is the Holy Spirit. The Father is uncreated, the Son uncreated, the Holy Spirit uncreated. The Father is infinite, the Son infinite, the Holy Spirit infinite. The Father is eternal, the Son eternal, the Holy Spirit eternal. Yet they are not three who are eternal, but there is one who is eternal. Just as they are not three who are uncreated, nor three who are infinite, but there is one who is uncreated, and one who is infinite. In the same way the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet they are not three who are almighty, but there is one who is almighty. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God. Yet they are not three gods, but one God. So the Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord. Yet they are not three lords, but one Lord. For just as Christian truth compels us to confess each person individually to be God and Lord, so the true Christian faith forbids us to speak of three gods or three lords. The Father is neither made nor created nor begotten of anyone. The Son is neither made nor created, but is begotten of the Father alone. The Holy Spirit is neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there is one Father, not three fathers, one Son, not three sons, one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. 
And within this trinity, none comes before or after, none is greater or inferior. But all three persons are co-equal and co-eternal. So that in every way, as stated before, all three persons are to be worshipped as one God, and one God worshipped as three persons. Whoever wishes to be saved must have this conviction of the Trinity. It is furthermore necessary for eternal salvation truly to believe that our Lord Jesus Christ also took on human flesh. Now this is the true Christian faith. We believe and confess that our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, is both God and man. He is God, eternally begotten from the nature of the Father, and he is man, born in time from the nature of his mother, fully God, fully man, with rational soul and human flesh. Equal to the Father as to his deity, less than the Father as to his humanity. And though he is both God and man, Christ is not two persons, but one. One not by changing the deity into flesh, but by taking the humanity into God. One indeed, not by mixture of the natures, but by unity in one person. For just as the rational soul and flesh are one human being, so God and man are one Christ. He suffered for our salvation, descended into hell, rose the third day from the dead. He ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from there will come to judge the living and the dead. At his coming, all people will rise with their own bodies to answer for their personal deeds. Those who have done good will enter eternal life, but those who have done evil will go into eternal fire. This is the true Christian faith. Whoever does not faithfully and firmly believe this cannot be saved. Our service continues with the hymn of the day, hymn number 194.
grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our Lord, right now the people engaged in professional basketball and professional hockey are in the playoff portion of their seasons. Teams are vying to win a championship. Baseball is in full swing, and this fall, the teams that do the best will also begin playing to win baseball's championship. Many of us perhaps are looking to the kickoff of the football season and hoping that our favorite team will next February be playing in that championship. If you've ever watched those big games, it's not at all unusual that after the contest is over, a reporter gets a hold of one of the players from the winning team, perhaps the, the star player, maybe it's the, the person who made the bucket at the buzzer to win the game, maybe it's the person who scored the goal in overtime to bring the championship to his city and his team. And when they interview that individual and comment on the play that they made that won the game, it's not at all uncommon for that single player to state, and we presume they're being honest in their humility, that it was really a team effort. Yeah, I, I may have scored the winning goal, they're really implying, or yes, I may have had a key basket right at the end, but we all played a part, including the players who don't start the game but, but come in as substitutes. Everybody has a role to play, and without everyone doing their part, I would not have been in a position to make that last second basket or score that winning goal. Our team wouldn't have succeeded. This championship, this victory, was a team effort. And we would applaud that kind of a comment by an individual, especially if that player was the, the star of the team anyway. We would probably have to acknowledge, yes, that's true, when it's a team sport, everyone on the team contributes. Not only in the games, but in practice as well. Well, a lot of things in life don't have an awful lot of meaning, including, dare I say, professional sports. Only one team can win a championship, and that leaves all the other teams hoping for maybe better luck next year. And if our team does win the championship, it's great, we celebrate, we're happy for them, we're happy for ourselves, but we really contributed probably very little, unless we bought a ticket. And if our team loses the championship game, or if it wins, the next day, the sun comes up, we have to go to work, we have to go to school, the kids will still get sick, the car still may not start. Life really kind of goes on as always. Sports, again, without hoping to incur the wrath of any one of you, is really not that big of a deal. But something else is a big deal, and that is our salvation. And as we see from our readings this morning, and this particular sermon is not based on any one of the three readings, it is based on all three of the readings. Now don't let that scare you, that does not mean it's three times as long as the typical sermon. Maybe. What is more important than sports, our salvation, is really a team effort. And we're not a part of the team. It's a team effort of all three persons of God. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Probably the best known passage in all of scripture, even among people who really aren't church going folk, would be a portion of what John, uh, Jesus uh, exchanged with Nicodemus in John's Gospel. Chapter three, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That little passage right there, sometimes referred to as the gospel in a nutshell because it encapsulates, encapsulates the entire gospel of God in one verse, shows the team effort on God's part for our salvation. God had an attitude of love toward the world. 
This attitude was not something that had developed in God over time. This was God's attitude by his nature. We are familiar with that. We, we have attitudes that develop over time. If you love someone, that love may not have happened right away. A, a, a man and a woman meet. They fall in love. They eventually get married. It probably wasn't love at first sight by the biblical definition of love being a commitment to each other. How can you possibly be committed to someone you have never met before and don't know anything about? There may have been an attraction at first sight which led to asking her out on a date and eventually that grew into love in the commitment sense. But we didn't see them and they all instantly have committed love for them. It might be more closely aligned, the, the attitude of God, the loving attitude of God, it might more closely be aligned to a parent and a child. Mother goes into the hospital, come, a pregnant comes home with her son or her daughter. Mom and dad, first child, have the little guy, little gal at home. They love them. They don't have to work at that. This is their little guy, their little gal. They have an attitude of love right from the get-go. God's attitude toward us is an attitude of love. Has been, not when we were born and, and he saw how we were going to turn out. Not after we showed himself just how lovable we could really be. But from eternity, God's attitude toward us was one of love. And God's attitude led God to action. He loved the world so much that he gave the world a gift. He sent his son, his only begotten son, not one of a bunch, his only one. He didn't send him to show us how to be good people. He didn't send him down here to show us how to save ourselves, how to get right with God. He sent him down here so that he could die. Die for us. That whoever believes in him will not perish. God's attitude of love, which took a loving action to sacrifice his own son, is something that many have become convinced was done for them by the work of God, the Holy Spirit. Last week we celebrated Pentecost, Pastor Lindholm mentioned in his sermon, the work of the Holy Spirit to, to make us holy, to lead us to believe in Jesus as our Savior, to sanctify us, to cleanse us of our sin. Not to save us, Jesus has done that. But Jesus has saved everyone. Many don't know it, many don't believe it, because the Holy Spirit hasn't had the opportunity to work in their hearts, or in some cases he has, and they've resisted it. But God the Father did his part. He planned out our salvation before time ever began. God the Son fulfilled his role. He came to this earth, lived perfectly, died innocently, and then rose again to prove that everything he was supposed to do, he did, and that our salvation is sure. God the Holy Spirit hasn't dropped the ball either. He has convinced us that all those things God the Father planned and all the things that God the Son did, he did for you and for me. Our salvation is a team effort by the winning team, the team of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's wonderful for us. But that does leave us with this funny little Sunday in the church here that we call Trinity Sunday. The Sunday in which we not only focus on what God does, which we do many Sundays of the year and other festival occasions, such as Christmas Day, whatever day of the week it may fall on, not only do we look at what God has done, but we look more closely at who or what God is. That God is three persons in one God, that God is triune, as we say. A teaching of the Bible that is beyond our ability to comprehend, but one that we accept because that's the way God reveals himself to us. And so that's what we do is we take God at his word. In the last few weeks, there have been a lot of graduations from colleges, high schools, there'll be more to come especially uh, today, Luther High School graduates, but, but most of the colleges are probably done with their graduations, or will be very shortly. Lots of young men and women are going out into the world, getting that first job. They have perhaps already sent out their resume, or if not, they will. 
That resume will list who they are, include their age, include any experiences they've had in this particular field, give a prospective employer as much information as he or she can have about this individual that they're going to hire and start to pay, perhaps a, a very handsome salary, to do a job which may be very important and actually have some ramifications for the well-being of other people, depending on what kind of work it is. And so you're the employer. At your desk comes across the resume of a 22-year-old young lady. You look at it. Maybe there's even a picture of her. You certainly see her name, where she attended school, the classes she took, how well she did. Oh, well, she was well. She did quite well in her classes. She made the dean's list every semester she was there. All good things so far. No criminal record. It's always a positive, I suppose. This is what we know, but so we hire the young lady. You, you hire her for your company. She turns out to be a pretty decent employee. Not the best, certainly not the worst, above average. You also have a, a resume from a young man. You look at it, it gives you information. You hire him. He turns out to be uh, maybe a little below average. Not quite as dependable as you wish, and perhaps after a certain period of time, when things seem to still not be clicking, you have to bring him in and say, we're sorry, we're going to have to let you go. The resume was all you had to go, and you, you had no way of knowing that this individual was dependable or not by looking at what they'd done in college, at university, at some of their past experiences. There was nothing on there that listed they'd ever been fired. You checked some of the references they put down, they said, well, yeah, they, they were a pretty good worker. But for some reason, what those previous employers said didn't seem to translate for your company. Maybe it was the type of work, maybe it was the longer hours. Those might have been part-time jobs. Yeah, they were always pretty dependable at their part-time job, but now we want them to work 40 hours a week, 50 weeks a year, and show up, rain or shine, whether they feel like it or not, and they didn't turn out to be quite as good of an employee as we had hoped. What we know about God is all we see of him revealed to us in the scriptures. There he gives us his resume, telling us who he is what he thinks, what he's done. He tells us that he is one God in three persons, or more correctly, three persons in one God. He tells us that each of those persons has a distinct role, if you will, although they don't operate so independently of each other that one says to the other, what are you doing? Or, I didn't know you were gonna do that. They all work very closely together but the Father did not die, the Holy Spirit did not rise from the grave. That was the work of God the Son. God the Son does not proceed to go into the world and spread the gospel. That's the work of God the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit did not send the Son. That was the Father. But they all knew what the other one was doing at the time they did it and well before. This is not something that's going to be easily explained. In fact, it's not explicable at all. And that's okay. We don't have to feel like because we don't understand something, it, pos it can't possibly be. And yet there are those who will. There are many who would challenge the teaching of the Trinity and say, that's not possible, that makes no sense. To which we would readily say, yep, you're right, it makes no sense to us. But we don't have to understand something for it to be true. I would have to confess that even though I've changed my own oil many times, and fixed a few things here and there on the car, I'm not fully understanding how the internal combustion engine works. It doesn't stop me from using a car. I have no idea how a personal computer works. I don't understand emails. I can't figure out a smartphone to save my soul. Doesn't mean they don't work. Doesn't mean I can't use them. I just don't understand. I don't understand how God can be three persons in one God. I never will. I don't think I have to because my salvation does not depend on me understanding what God is. It just depends on me believing what God is. And your salvation does not depend upon you understanding how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit can all be equal in one God and yet three distinct persons. That's okay. 
It only requires you to accept God as he reveals himself. And by his grace and through his power, you do. And so you don't have to worry about what he is, but more focused on what he's done for you and your salvation. So you're that employer. Resume comes across your desk. You take a chance, you hire the person. They don't seem to be doing much at all. And the resume doesn't look all that impressive, but turns out they're not such a bad employee. An employer once had a, a woman come to work for him. She walked in, he didn't think much of her as his, her appearance. She dressed kind of schluppy, as he referred to it. Ill-fitting boots, it was winter time. But he hired her. Later on, confessed one thing. Best employee he'd ever had. We look at God, our Savior, our Maker, our Sanctifier. And we may not understand, but that's okay. Because even though he reveals himself in a way that we can't understand him, he's going to be the best we'd ever have. And his work will be flawless. His resume may look odd to us as he reveals himself, but that's all right. He is going to be everything we need and so much more because he already is everything we need and so much more. Our Father, our Savior, our Sanctifier, our God, our Triune God, whom we believe and one day whom we will know very fully. Amen. Please rise. And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please remain standing as the offering is brought forward.
Creator Spirit, you have opened our eyes by the bright light of your word. You have burst through our deafness with the clear sound of your voice in the scriptures. You have breathed into us new life by the power of the gospel. Through word and sacrament, help us grow in understanding the breadth and depth and height of the love of God. Make us firm in our resolve to do battle with our sin. In every weakness be our strength, that we may show ourselves to be God's true children, faithful in prayer, constant in hope, and fervent in love. O Holy Trinity, you are the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of every comfort. From you and through you and to you are all things. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so to praise your holy name forever. Amen. Special prayer is offered this morning on behalf of the, uh, on, on the occasion of the anniversary, rather, of Bryce and Beth Grahams. Also, um, Carl and Ann Semke would be celebrating their anniversary around this time as well. The Lord took Carl to his side a number of years ago, but we remember them in our prayers. We also remember in our prayers this morning our graduates from our congregation. As mentioned earlier, this afternoon, Luther High School will graduate. Our members, Ari Bacalars and James Biedenbender, will receive their diplomas. Uh, also, a number of our members have graduated from our Mount Calvary Grace Lutheran School, as well as various colleges and universities. Their names and schools are listed in uh, your current June issue of the newsletter. We pray. Lord Jesus, your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the grace by which you have sustained your servants, Bryce and Beth Grahams, throughout their married life. We ask that you continue to fill their hearts with the unselfish love that reflects your sacrificial love for them, so that their love for each other might never grow weary. With every joy and sorrow that they share, bring them closer to one another, and to you, their God and Lord. We thank you also for the years that you have granted to Carl and Ann Semke before you took Carl to your side. We pray that you would continue to comfort Ann with the love of her family and the support of her friends, and the knowledge that you are always at her side, and that you will ultimately take her and all of your children into glory everlasting. Encourage all husbands and wives as we seek to fulfill their marriage promises. Bless all of our homes with your abiding peace. Holy Spirit, sent by Jesus to guide us into all truth, shower your gifts and graces upon all the graduates. Make them truly grateful to all, that, all those who have helped them with their education. Enable them to use the lessons that they have learned to advance their own welfare, to serve others, and to glorify your name. As they step into an uncertain future, beginning the next chapter of their lives, strengthen them through your word and sacraments, that they may be comforted and reassured by your presence. Teach them to demonstrate true wisdom and understanding by fearing and loving you and by keeping your commandments. We pray this in Jesus' name, who with you and the Father are one Lord now and forever. As we come to you in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We'll continue with our next hymn, hymn number 724.